It's a great pleasure to welcome Farah Pandit, Thank U.S. You. Special Representative to Muslim Communities Worldwide, yes. to Harvard University, to the Future of Diplomacy Project. Farah, just a, a question first about your role. There is no predecessor in this position. You, you are new in this position, but the position also is unique to the Obama administration. Talk about what, the, what your objectives are. This is, you're correct, this is the first time in American history we have a special representative to Muslim communities, and it's a great pleasure to have that role. Um, it is really unique because it's focused on people to people. Um, we are not doing uh, a relationship building between bilateral, you know, bilateral uh, countries. We are trying to get to know what's happening on the ground. So yeah. I am meeting with students and scholars and artists and comedians and bloggers and entrepreneurs and getting a sense uh, at the grassroots level what's taking place so that our embassies around the world can do more to think about ways we can build dialogue, build partnership, build networks across the world of like-minded thinkers. Uh, and it's been a tremendously interesting way of thinking about leveraging uh, ideas and energy and passion for dialogue building. And President Obama, of course, from his inaugural speech yes. to the Cairo speech and now to the Jakarta speech, has made a point of using um, his credibility in yes. the world to speak to Muslim communities. How is the United States doing in relating to Muslim communities, in portraying an accurate message about our society? Is this strategy working? So this is really a very special moment in time because the president on day one, as you said, his inauguration, spoke to one faith group, yes. spoke to Muslims, and he said he wanted us to rebuild and restore an opportunity for partnership. And in Ankara and in Cairo and now in Jakarta, he's laid out a framework of how he wants to do that mutual interest and mutual respect. He's laid out a toolkit of ways in which we can do that through entrepreneurship, through issues of health and education and technology and science. Um, and so his frame has changed. He wants to build partnerships in new ways. And I think for us, as we think about that opportunity, a president that's laid it out front and center right away, uh, is very important for us to be able to, um, to take the movement and, and go forward. And so how is it doing? It's going very, very well because from my my perspective, as I think about, um, I've been to 30 countries in one year um, around the world, Muslim majority countries and Muslims that live as minorities. In every place that I go, they are obviously focused on the fact the president has made it a priority to engage with them. They're really interested that we're looking at different frames, not just a security frame, but a frame of interest that has to do with entrepreneurship or science. Um, they're very interested in the partnership and dialogue building. They want to be uh, able to offer um, added value to building constructive societies, and this is our effort to do so. At the same time, there are challenges, of course, um, and in every conversation that I, that I have around the world, um, they ask about questions the President laid out in Cairo as well. He stated he wanted to work on several foreign policy things, whether it is Israel-Palestine, uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan, Iraq, the closure of Guantanamo Bay. We get those questions too, but to weigh things out, to, to ask the question and think it's either this or this is, I think, a, a false premise. I think what you need to think about is, has any president ever done this before? No. Um, how are we doing this? We're using the might of every part of our government to do it. I work at the State Department, but every Every department and agency around, around Washington, D.C. is actually engaged in this. So whether you're the Department of Commerce or you're uh, the Department of Education, you're thinking about frames in which we can build dialogue. Um, and so while he's working on foreign policy things that are challenging and difficult, we're also working on building relationships um, to, to think long term. So I think it is going well, and I think it's, very, uh, it's a very noble effort, um, but it's very important that we understand how uh, unprecedented this is and how we're, we're in a moment where we can take a look at the energy that's taking, at the, taking place at the grassroots, and that's where I'm focused on. The Cairo speech made a major impact worldwide. It was news all over the world that an American president would go into the heart of the Arab world and give a speech about relations yeah. that had been frayed because of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Were you pleased? Have you been pleased by the reception to it? And, and what's the journey from the Cairo speech to the Jakarta speech in terms mm. of maybe some, some demonstration that relations really are better uh, around the world? So, it, you know, what I've, uh, I, I take the long view in terms of 
how we think about the journey of relationships between the American government and people. Um, people are very skeptical at first because they don't think anything can ever get done. But when you think about the short two years that it is that we've we've watched the president put this agenda forward, um, the interest that he's taken in making sure that he talks about. Um, the importance that our country places on diversity and pluralism, the importance of freedom of faith, the way in which he's talked about, the lexicon has changed, his tone and his tenor has changed. When you look at the cues that have been set up and the way in the president has walked forward and asked and has extended a hand, it really is very, uh, it's very um, exciting when I think about this because no one has ever done this before and in this way. Um, as I see people around the world, um, I am focused very specifically on the young generation. And Secretary Clinton has asked me to look at that demographic, those, those people under the age of 30. So how, and there are 1.6 billion yeah. Arab, uh, Muslims in the world. And what percentage are under 30? More than 62% are of 1.6 billion yes. are, are under the age of, of um, 30. And that's the, what I, uh, a generation I call generation change. Mm -hmm. That's a generation that is a generation that has the capacity to do amazing things or not be leveraged at all. We want to leverage them. We want to hear what they have to say. Um, in everything that I do, and all mo my work, um, we're looking, we're talent scouting, we're taking a look at the amazing people that you don't usually read about on the, in the front pages of the New York Times. We're, we're hearing about the young entrepreneur or the interesting uh, scholar who's just done something or the young tech um, tech activist who's creating momentum online to create a new frame of thinking about Islam or Muslims. No matter what way you look about look at things, whether you're talking about issues of human rights or poverty, or you're looking at education and uh, equality, no matter what the issues are that young people are thinking about, this is a generation, Nick, that has had a frame from which they're going forward that no other Muslim generation has had before. Every single day since September 12th, online and offline, this generation has seen the word Islam or Muslims on the front page. Mm -hmm. How does that shape who they are? How do they think about their identity? And frankly, that's the key issue that I've been seeing around the world. How do young people navigate their identity? As we see a young kid in Suriname or in Stockholm or in Solo, Indonesia, they're very different. But they're all, this generation is all asking the question, how can I be modern and Muslim? What's the difference between culture and religion? This is why it's important for us to be able to engage with this demographic. And Farah, it, it, it's, it's obvious that, um, that this is going to take a sustained mm. national effort that will require the efforts both of our government but also of our private sector. So it's kind of obvious to me what the government can do, sure. as the president has been doing so effectively through his speeches and actions to bridge this division that we see in the world. What can private Americans do? What can we at Harvard University yeah. do? What can the business sector do so to, help, to help in this cause? I'm really happy you asked me that because I think that it's a combined effort. Um, we want to engage with one-fourth of humanity. It is the right thing to do. There are partnerships that we can build for the common good. And we cannot create an us and a them. We have to create a we. And the way to do that is to have both government and the private sector work together. The role the government plays is the convener and the facilitator and the intellectual partner with the ideas that are on the ground. The role that the private sector can play and the role universities can play are very important. Why? The universities are framing, you're framing the issues of the day. How you talk about the narrative, how you talk about the lexicon, how you think about the issues of the day infects how everybody hears about them in real, in real time, real people out there. So what your scholars and your students are saying and shaping and talking about makes a difference on the front page of a paper halfway across the world. Private sector is critically important. They have the can-do spirit. They have shorter timelines. They have um, money that they can put into projects that aren't connected to government. So they're not, quote unquote, tainted. Um, and that's very important. And in fact, the president had his entrepreneurship summit in April of, of uh, this past year, which was a huge success and, and really tremendously important because he took the tool of entrepreneurship that one person can make a difference. So whether you're a social entrepreneur or a business entrepreneur. But what I thought was really exciting about that were the initiatives that came out of it as well, including Partners for a New Beginning, which was exactly this issue of private sector. We have Coca-Cola Corporation, we have the Aspen Institute, mm -hmm. and we have former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright 
working together to see where American corporations can work together to be able to seed projects around the world that are going to help humanity and help one fourth of one, one fourth of humanity in new ways. So they're leveraging their might, and I think when I think about ways that we can get to a place where we're not. Um, buying into this narrative of us and them. When we're looking at a, a, a global uh, connectivity, it has to be a partnership between the government and the private sector on how we do that. Yeah. Um, a final question. We've just gone through a searing decade yeah. from 9 11 to the Afghan war to the Iraq war, Guantanamo, all of these very difficult issues that have separated us in many ways, America from the Muslim world and the Arab world. Um, it seems to me that President Obama is really emphasizing the return of diplomacy, mm. the primacy of diplomacy, the primacy of engagement. Are you hopeful that we've weathered the worst in terms of a gap in international public communication and that we're on the rebound and we can look for, for better results and better days ahead? I'm actually very optimistic for the possibilities of cooperation um, between Muslims and non-Muslim Muslims together um, and countries as we work uh, as we work on, on very important issues because we don't have another option, Nick. Here we are in the world, um, almost 10 years past 9/11, where we've seen destruction and a manipulation of narrative of a manipulation of what Islam means um, that has affected people in ways that we couldn't ever, as diplomats, have expected. And so you see our ambassadors on the ground working with their foreign service officers and teams, reframing and restructuring things that they've been doing for decades but have to do in a different way because of the global narrative that's out there. I'm positive and optimistic because we have the leadership by the president, we have the leadership of Secretary Clinton who has invested in this type of diplomacy, this people-to-people, -people, grassroots diplomacy, the instruction to all of our, our embassies around the world to really be paying attention to the nuances so that you're not just looking at a Spain, for example, you're understanding what's happening in a Madrid versus what's happening in a Barcelona with Muslim communities. Um, that we've looked at Islam not just from the prism of the Middle East, but we are understanding how important it is that we get the fact that most Muslims live outside of the Middle East, so that we're, we're looking at globally an in Indonesia a, a Suriname, a Morocco, a Norway. You're going in every part of the world. And I'm optimistic, most importantly, because I get to meet the young people. And mm -hmm. I know what is taking place with this generation. And this is a generation that is not going to sit back. And if we look at the numbers, strictly the numbers, you have all these millions of young Muslims around the world who want to be part of the conversation and not be excluded by them. It's our time to tap into them. Farah, thank you very much for being with us at Harvard University thank today. You. It's been, it, it's been a, a great discussion, and good luck in all your endeavors. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you.